good morning, a very special moment is about to occur. Since the only piece missing for our creative vending upgrade in Nomi Factory Unofficial is a single Creative RF source, which happens to be conveniently located uh, somewhere in here. There it is. If we place the source in here, there it is, the creative quantum chest. So, let's go over some stats. I have 211 hours. Espish has 110, so that's about 320 hours total to obtain the uh, creative quantum chest. Uh, not counting offline chunk loading as always. First of all, let's start things off at the old uh, pre-tank base. As you can see, most of it has been ripped out, aside from some random things that would be annoying to move over. So we still have the AE terminals, the molecular assemblers, the packaged auto. Uh, this is the wall of shame, which is all the old drawers from pre-tank automations that we couldn't be bothered to do anything with, so we just stuck them here. <laughs> Deep mob learning. Uh, we still use a HV uh, multi-smelter, even in post-tank era. Which is pretty funny. Espish uh, built this. I have no idea what it is, and at this point I'm too afraid to ask. Alright, now let's get to the actual post-tank stuff. So, as you probably noticed, we decided to move to a space station for the purposes of looking cool, and uh, also infinite solar panel time, or free tank. Ooh! He has joined. No! <laughs> Anyways, where were we? So, in the middle, we have our big powerball, which is currently at 4% full. We have some big CPUs in the middle to handle all of our post-tank crafting needs, along with this super big one, which I believe is around 5 million bytes worth of crafting storage, so uh, quite sizable. So the first thing we built over here is the fluid solidification wall. So once you have the creative tank, one of the first things you want to do is to just fully passive like all the different kinds of blocks you can. So I like to refer to this area as the washing machine area, because when all of the solidifiers are running, it sounds like a washing machine, which is pretty funny. Then for post-tank power, we were originally actually going to do Naquita reactors, as you can see over here, but uh, in this version of the pack, they are bugged. So you can fix it by updating the mod, which this is from, which is uh, multi-block something, I think, multi-block madness. Um, but this turned out to be a big fail. So in the end, we just went with a big stack of plasma towers um, powered with nickel plasma and I think this makes like 32 million RF per tick or something like that. So that was enough to last us until the creative RF source. Now let's go over a few more automations. So this is the only clean room recipe setup that you need post tank due to the existence of the clean room maintenance hatch. So you can make all the multi-blocks uh, automatically clean except for the sterile one. And you do need, uh, oh, sorry about the noise. You do need stem cells, which is the only um, sterile clean room recipe you need to do post tank, since this is used in a bunch of stuff. So that's that. These LCRs are for uh, passive UHPICs and HPICs. Then we have two on demand assembly lines right here. These ones do all of the uh, assembly line components. These ones do all the energy hatches, since for some of these you need Naquadria, and since you can only have like four uh, fluid inputs, we needed a second assembly line in order to have the uh, sodium potassium. Uh, it's very annoying. I really wish you could have like six uh, fluid hatches on the one assembly line, so you could just have all the recipes in the same thing. But uh, it is what it is. Um, also the world accelerators, I think, need Enderium. Anyways, over here we have a few automations of stars. So quantum stars, gravity stars, and ender stars, which are used for infinity ingots. Basically, all these automations are just for infinity ingots or some kind of infinity-related product. So this blast furnace, this is a very, this is what I think is very funny. Oh, Espish has crashed again. So uh, one of the materials you need a fair amount of in the late game is quantum flux deuterium heavy plating, which is used in the tier 9 miner, which is used for universe data, which is used for heart of the universe which is used for Infinity Catalyst. So we never actually passived this, and I really don't know why. It honestly was just a bit of a meme to see if we could do it. 
Um, so we have a very strong Blast Furnace here with the max tier coils. And it's not even UIV. Look at that. Look at us go. The power of offline chunk loading. So yeah, this was <laughs> this was on demand, which is pretty funny. Anyways, moving right along. Over here, we have another on-demand fusion crafting for fusion computers and some of this stuff. Honestly, these ones here, these energy orb clusters, we should have passived since you need a very hefty amount. It's in the few thousands for draconic energy cores. So I believe in normal Nomi factory, uh, these energy modules are replaced with double compressed octatic capacitors, which are a lot cheaper than these. Like these are very expensive. So that's a bit of a, a CEU change. That's a lot harder instead of a lot easier. Because a lot of things in CEU are a lot easier. And I'll demonstrate one of them now. And it is that all machines, basically, can be run at UIV power. And you might be thinking, that not that a Greg Akality thing? How does normal Greg Tech go up to UIV power? And it is due to the existence of the 16 amp UHV energy hatch. This guy right here. So 16 amps of UHV is equivalent to 1 amp of UIV. So that is what we are running. Now, one important thing to point out is that the converter, the 16 amp UHV energy converter, is actually bugged. So <laughs> you can see over here, the converter of Shane. When you try and fill this guy with power, because it's more than 2 billion RF or something like that, it just gets confused and doesn't do anything. So the way to get around that is by using two 8 amp UHV converters and then everything runs normally. So to transfer all of our energy wirelessly around the base, we're using phantom energy faces from actually additions. So what these guys do is they pretend they are another block. Um, so you have one for items, one for liquids, and one for energy. So this energy, uh, Phantom Face, prete is pretending that he is this output energy pylon. You can see the, the lag get a little bit real here with all the particles <laughs> because we have a lot of Phantom Energy Faces sprinkled around the base. And they're all connected to this output pylon or our energy ball. This right here is our on-demand uh, crafting of Greg Tech stuff. So Circuit Assembler, which honestly we only used for a very small period post-tank due to us passiving soon after. We have the material press, all the stuff from pre-tank basically, except we have upgraded them to UIV power and also the max parallel control hatch. So these are our large microverse projectors. So interestingly enough, with our microverse missions post-tank, we only ever passived tiers one and two. So if we search micro minor, oops, micro minor, so the tier one, you need passive for dilithium. And also as a bonus, you get redstone, which you can use for rotocrosite, which is very good. And tier two, you need to have passive for stellar data for the universe creation data. All the other micro minor missions, you can, we, well, at least we just did on demand. So um, we basically had one big ball per mission. So this one here is for chaos shards. This here is for dragon layer data. This was just our medium one that we had to move over just because, like for grains of infinity and lapis and all of that sort of thing. This blast furnace is for crystal chips. This is one of the very few, I think you only need three blast furnaces post tank. Uh, crystal chips, Eternium plating, uh, maybe mana infused ingots, and also some form of silicon bull, which you'll see over there momentarily. So that's that. These are the actual passive. Microminers. So we have, I believe this is tier one running for dilithium and redstone. So we just have an input bus, an interface, and a robot arm supplying the exact amount. Similarly, over here, we have a input bus and a interface. <laughs> and then here, we have the uh, rotocrosite, the aforementioned rotocrosite being produced somewhere in one of these interfaces. There you go. So this worked out very well as we had a very large <laughs> excess of rotocrosite by the end. That 117k, if you multiply that by 12, that is a uh, that is a lot of redstone ore that has been processed through this one machine. This is where we recharge our air, this is our airtight seal. Okay, let us move into the outer ring of the base. So we have a bunch of processing arrays for bending machines and wire mills. And here we have platinum foil and plates, uh, niobium titanium foil and plates. A lot of this is for circuit crafting, actually. Electrum foil and plates, gold foil and plates, copper, annealed copper, and then we move to the wire mills. So we have electrum, uh, copper, platinum, no, maybe even titanium, and then 
I think we accidentally made two lots of Yttrium Barium Cuprate, so we had to change that. <laughs> so just the excess draws just got stacked here because of the draw controller. We have Red Alloy, we have Indium Tin Thingy, we have Rude Wire, Vanadium Gallium Wire, and... Oh, Nether Stars. Okay, I guess this is a bit of an outlier. Since you can't actually down-convert the block of Nether Star into stars directly, you have to use a four Hammer, which is a little bit strange, but um, it had to be done, I suppose. So most of these... Their purpose is for circuits. Uh, ooh, there's a few more over here. What is this? Uranium, rhodium thingy, and europium. Okay. The server was running for about seven days without us doing anything. So we had all of our passive machines working uh, for those few days. So we didn't really have to worry about, like, huge scaling up. Like, we did have to scale up a fair amount, as you can probably tell. But for, as an example, we only had two uh, simulation supercomputers for... Dragon Lay data, and we have 1.3 million spare. So, yeah. Whereas if you're playing this on a single player or you want to finish the pack a little bit faster, you'll probably have to build a few more of these. But um, this was sufficient. Moving back over to the circuit line, um, we have full draws of all the different kinds of circuit boards. So epoxy, fiber reinforced, extreme, wetware. I'll demonstrate uh, further automation of these guys in a different part of the base. That's basically what all of these LCRs are doing. So some of them have normal maintenance hatches. Some of them have the clean room maintenance hatch because they need to be made in a clean room. Uh, pretty standard automation. I don't really feel like I should explain any of the automation like in depth because it's pretty much all the same. It's just interfaces, input buses, machines. It's more just like the, um, the actual setting up process that's important because all the actual automation techniques are very similar. Okay, we're going to get distracted slightly by crafting the creative chest. All right, the honors have been done. The quantum chest has been obtained. Creative vending upgrade, rather. In fact, the first thing that I'd like to do with the, with the quantum chest is to produce vending upgrades because that sounds very funny to me. Yes, vending upgrade, let's go. Oh yeah, and that also marks our quest book 100% complete. With all of that being said and done, let us continue showcasing. So, Espish built this. It is passive atomic reconstructors for uh, any desired material we have. So we use this for Leather, uh, Restonia, and Inori, since you need those for, I think, batteries, which are used in the um, Wyvern Energy Core. <clears throat> Voice crack. This is Lapatron Crystals. So, as I mentioned earlier, in the Draconic Energy Core recipe, which you need several thousand of, you need these energy modules instead of the double compressed octatic capacitors like in default Nomi. So these take a lot of engraved Lapatron chips, which take a lot of all this stuff that I'm clicking on right now. So this setup right here is dedicated to passiving all of that sort of thing. So they're all UIV powered by Phantom Energy Face. These green multi blocks, I don't know if I explain it yet, but they're advanced processing arrays. So if you've played normal Nomi, you probably won't have these. Oops, I just searched Nomi. Uh, what am I looking for? Processing arrays. So you're probably used to the blue processing array. You're probably used to the blue one. So in CEU, we have the green one, and they're super good. They can run 64 as opposed to 16. So that's what these guys do. What is this one? Oh, Blaze Pater. Oh yeah, because we, we ran out of quantumize at one point, so I had to make a system for Blaze Powder using carbon and sulfur. So sulfur, you can get from fluid because sulfur dioxide and carbon you can also get from fluid i think we do electrolysis of something maybe this isoprene i don't know but that's how we're getting blaze powder super quickly anyways uh, so that's these guys oh yes this was this was the setup that i built originally but it was way too slow so we switched it to processing arrays and it was fine from then on and i guess we have a luminescence as an extension on this setup this setup here is for quantum flux so we have a crafter taking solidified experience and extraterrestrial matter from the system. Solidified experience, by the way, we have a max draw full, and that is because it is very easy to get solidified experience. So as you can see, there is a, uh, a lot of solidified experience in, in this uh, machine here. Anyways, moving right along, we have our passive soul binders. So we have one for making flight control units, and we have five dedicated to making prescient crystals. You don't need any more. I think in normal Nomi, you also need sentient enders, 
for one of the wetware uh, name, mainframes, but luckily this is CEU, which is a very cool, and you do not need it. You only need these two, and not even that many either. Uh, so now we move on to passive machine wall number one. There's another one way over there, which I'll show soon. So all of these materials are basically dedicated to making warp engines. It's very simple automation. It's just interface, supplies items, goes into machine, goes into drawer. And then we have storage bus. It's That's it, just repeated a bajillion times for all these different materials. This is the big tower of mechanical crafters, automating anything that needs vanilla crafting. So I'll just fly up here so you can get an idea of everything that we've automated using crafters. I guess. <laughs> so all of this basically is again for warp engines. You can see we have random warp cores there as well. And now moving up, this is where we start to automate this stuff for microminers. You can see there the tier one microminer and a few other components. I think this is for, what the heck was that sound? Oh, the fusion crafting. <laughs> so this is for our reinforced mining lasers. And then a few other random stuff. I think some of this is for tier two microminers. Yep, there you go and then just some random stuff at the top. We actually basically had the perfect amount. So I asked Espish to make it, and then he just built this huge tower, and I was like, okay, we might need more, we might need less, we'll see. And it was basically the perfect amount, so uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Moving along, we have our fusion crafting towers, throwback to NTC2, where we needed millions of opinion cores. So these are very cool though, I do like these, it's always fun making them. So once again, we have ME system, providing all the necessary items. We are using the based Actually Editions item laser relays to provide all the items very easily with basically no configuring and uh, we just copy and paste the setup all the way. So I did see a suggestion from someone in Discord saying that I should use uh, laser relays to power the injectors rather than having to spam the superconductor conduit because it looks a little bit cleaner and I do agree. However, by the time I saw that I'd already built this and I didn't really want to change it. So uh, there's that. But other than that, pretty simple, just redstone clocks, materials being provided, and materials going into drawer. So we have a array of 16 crafters doing wyvern cores, an array of 16 crafters doing dislocators. Also, I recommend using a super chest for dislocators rather than a drawer, because dislocators only stack to one. So you'll only be able to hold like 7,000 in a fully upgraded drawer. Whereas a super chest, you can hold millions, right? Also, it is very loud. I do apologize for the noise, but uh, that's just how it is. So over here, we have a small automation for chorus flowers and wood, so that we can make like all our drawers and stuff. So this is making us photo grow from wood. I don't. I didn't actually set this up. This was an Espish build. So I'm just gonna say it automates wood and chorus flowers and leave it at that. Over here, we have a small automation. Or well, not small. We have a smaller automation for. Uh, what is this? Stabilizers, energy core stabilizers. This one is pretty easy. It's just diamantine and uh, particle generators. And then we have an even smaller uh, array for uh, the heads, the manipulators and, and the energy manipulators. Both of these are used in the tier seven microminer. So you need several thousand of both. And then here we have the smallest tower of all for awaken cores, which you need for various crafts, I suppose. I don't know. It was getting very slow making it in the on-demand fusion. so. We built a, a passive system. This is passive packaged auto for making the supercharged laser arrays and the tier two microminer. We this was actually the only passive packaged auto that we did. We didn't have to do any others. Well, we could have, but we chose not to. So the way we do this is we supply the items from ME system once again. We use limited item filter to put them into the packager. I did show off a similar setup to this in my NTC two base tour. If you're interested, go check that out. So just Supply limited item filter supplies one of each stack. It's also very easy in this because we have Ender IO and limited item filters, so you don't have to do the whole integrated dynamics setup. But it uh, crafts, gets extracted, goes into drawer. Uh, well, there's the extra step with the uh, the laser arrays that it has to go into the uh, chem reactor with radon to make these. Oh, I hear it, Espish. There he is. What is he giving me? <laughs> Cursed, uncraftable microminers. Very nice. And then we just have the same setup with uh tier two miners. It goes into here and this is of course for the stellar data or universe data. So this was our starting machine array for our Ruby but it wasn't fast enough so we upgraded to the processing array. Um, what is this for? Superconductor wires. Okay. 
I believe this processing array is for draconium, since we were consuming a vast amount in our fusion towers, and the one IV solidifier we had doing it wasn't fast enough. So now we get to the big circuit chipset crafting line array, whatever you want to call it. So we should actually start off with the rotary hearth furnace, which is making neutronium bulls. You do not need to do this, but I recommend because it is one of the coolest multi-blocks in the pack, and you only really get access to it post-tank. So uh, make it for the experience is what I would recommend. Once again, getting power, items from the ME system, fluid from creative tank, goes into draw. You've seen it all before. It's the usual sort of automation stuff. Then over here, we actually decided just for fun to use phantom faces as opposed to the ME system, because uh, why not, to provide the new, actually no, sorry, my mistake. First of all, it goes over here to get cut into the wafers, and then we send them to these laser engravers. So all of this stuff that you see here is from Gregor Multi Multiblocks. So there's a few advantages, a few disadvantages to using them over processing arrays, but uh, it's up to you really to, to decide whether you want to do it in processing arrays or not for the various post-tank processes. I don't know, it's fun to mix things up a little bit, I think. So we have SOC wafers, PIC wafers, ASOC, RAM, NOR, engraved Lapatron chip. This was for, this is uh, the next stage in the Lapatron processing that we saw earlier. The crystal CPUs and the crystal socks. And also highly advanced socks and CPU wafers. This one I don't actually think is necessary since the only use for nano CPUs that we needed was like for this and it wasn't even that many. So I don't know. We just had it anyways. <laughs> then over here are the cutting machines, for everything. So just taking the wafers and cutting them into their respective chipsets. This is dilithium. So we are taking the uh, ore, we are crushing it. Uh, let's just look at JEI. So we're taking the ore, we are crushing it, we are autoclaving it, and we get the crystals. You need, I think, several million dilithium crystals to finish the pack. So uh, <laughs> make sure this is like super duper upgraded and very good if you are planning on doing post tank. So this is SMD components, pulling items from the ME system, going into assemblers, going into the drawer. Very simple stuff. And also graphene, because you need this for uh, for one of them. Here we go, SMD resistor. Something interesting that I would like to comment about graphene. So graphene actually takes uh, somewhere here, graphite, which is one of the only ingots that you cannot solidify funnily enough like there's no solidification recipe for graphite so when we were starting the post tank journey we were always running out of graphite and it was very annoying so what we did was we launched a bunch of tier 4 dense ore missions now this was had a twofold purpose one of them was to get lapis since you need a few million lapis for all the Lapatron and energy module stuff. But a byproduct is that we got a lot of dense diamond ore, which, uh, Espish just threw something on me, uh, gives you a byproduct of graphite when you do ore processing. And I'll show I'll show our post-tank ore processing off momentarily. But this was the solution. So if you're post-tank and you're having graphite troubles, just run a few, few hundred tier four dense ore missions and we'll have huge amounts. Like how much leftovers do we have at the moment? 600,000, okay. So no issues anymore. So yeah, this was that. This is conduit automation, I believe. All the different uh, nine tiers. Super, superconductor conduits are automated over at the wire automation. So we have wire mills for all the different ingots, and then we have assemblers, all the different tiers, I guess, importing from the ME system, as always. And then this is a multi-smelter multi for the conduit binder. This is the second big machine automation wall. We saw the first one over there. So we have, <laughs> once again, interfaces, drawers, power, etc. I don't. I feel. I feel like this needs uh, no explaining. It's just. It's just machines making things. Let's start with the circuit assemblers. So we have neuroprocessing units, wetware boards, wetware. What is this? Processors, and then just all the circuits of wetware, crystal. Quantum, nano, is this micro? No, integrated, and micro. All in circuit assemblers, all fully maxed out, running at, oh, UHV power, okay. 
I guess we didn't run these at UIV power then, only UHV. Well, there you go. You don't need UIV for everything. It's just, it's cool. This makes everything super fast. The main things that I'd recommend having on UIV is stuff like assembly lines, because it will make your post tank process that much faster. Where stuff like um, these microprocessors, you know, you, it's not necessary to have it at UIV. That's just overkill. But they do have the super con parallel control hatches. So that's that. Once again, <laughs> pulling from the ME system, all the items, limited item filter. Well, not limited item filter, but we use a uh, robot arm with keep exact and all of the items. We only set this up recently. This is doing... Oh yeah, we needed some awakened draconium for flux capacitors for one of the creatives. And these are enchanters for a few different things you need for, I think, the creative RF source, or maybe the creative mill. I don't remember exactly. I showed this off before when I was talking about um, how we had to go... Well, we didn't have to, but we went AFK for a week, basically, or we didn't play for a week. But these are our Sim two simulation supercomputers. Both of them are doing dragon models for dragon layer data, which you need several million of in order to launch the chaos data missions. So you need four stacks per one of these, and you need like a few thousand of these. This is quartzite, I think. So I believe in in normal Nomi Factory, you can't actually passive quartzite outside of the tier one mission. So if we search quartzite ore, where is it? Here it is. Yeah, so you only really get it from this mission here. And obviously, you know, who wants to passive, like, another microminer mission when, you know, it's taking up resources. However, in CEU, you can actually get quartzite dust from a centrifuge process. Okay, I found it. So quartz sand uh, gets centrifuged into quartzite dust. The quartz sand comes from pulverite using sand. So that is how you are able to fully passive quartzite. And then we just have a few extra processes that I extended for black quartz. And I guess we have, this is where we do our dense hydrogen. This is our end game quartz making facility. So we have glass being produced then being electrolyzed, then going into the drawer. And the main use for the quartz actually is for lava crystals or wyvern cores, and you need many, many, many hundreds of thousands of these. So that is what this system is helping support. This is a few more endgame processes for basic materials, such as gravel, which you need for, like, conduit binder. We have sand, and then what is this? Oh, this is quartz sand for the, uh, for the quartzite, and then I guess we have glass. This is one of my favorite parts of the base, just because I think it looks really cool. It is the passive assembly lines. So, again... ME system interfaces providing items. They're all running at UIV power. They all have their fluids being provided, the creative tanks, and we are all storing them in drawers. So we have LUV pumps, we have UV field gens, ZPM field gens, LUV field gens, UV emitters, ZPM emitters, LUV emitters, and then finally motors, motors, and motors. And as a added bonus, we also have wetware supercomputers and Wetware mainframes. So that's all of our passive assemb assembly lines. Very, very cool. Was very fun to set up. This was mainly only used for Appetite, for some reason, Perfect Ruby, and Diamonds for Graphite. So it's basically just copy pasted from the old base, but upgraded to UIV and super parallel hatches. Macerate, uh, wash, macerate, centrifuge. And all the excess byproducts and stuff goes back to the ME system. It looks very clean, though. I do like how it's set up in this fashion. This was probably how we should have set it up uh, pre-tank with it like all in a line instead of a square. So very, very nice and posh, as they say. Uh, this is the orbital laser drill that we didn't need to make, but Espish was bored. So I guess we combine Mars now. This is our on-demand fusion crafting. So I do think this is kind of cool as well. So we have a interface with all the patterns, and then we have four item interfaces adjacent so we can run four recipes off the one interface. Like, we don't need multiple interfaces. I don't know. It's a small thing, but I think it's pretty cool. So we just have... This is the only instance of World Accelerators, by the way. Actually, no. I lie. There's one other instance of World Accelerators, which is this setup right here. We used to have one in the middle of these four resonators. And that is because you need about a full draw of red coal for the creative energy sources. But this only took, like, a couple of hours. So it wasn't too bad. I don't think I mentioned this when I was in this area. Um, then we have a few more 
on-demand microverse missions. So uh, we have universe data, we have part of the universe. Uh, we never passive these just because didn't need to. We just set up a few crafts, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, and they're all done, essentially. Have dragon hearts, and then, oh, friends of infinity. I guess this is something Espish moved over. So with all that being said, I do believe that brings the tour to a close. I'll just do a one last fly around in uh, F1, so you can see all of our all of our builds if you if you like. Oh yeah, there's our there's our warp core and our quantum ring, so we can uh, get AE access from the old base. It's uh, it, it's quite the sight to behold from uh from up here. It looks very cool. I don't think we're orbiting any planets at the moment, but uh. I think we were orbiting Mars at one point. It looks very cool from up here. I don't know. I could fly around here for ages. Definitely live in space if you have the opportunity. It's it's a really cool uh, backdrop with just all the stars in the distance and everything. <laughs> the Thomas troll face. Very nice. As Bish made this. But uh, I think that will do it. Also, I swapped to the Draconic chestplate uh, post-tank because I like the, uh, the flight lock and the inertia cancellation and the super fast speed. Oop, that's my face. So, still still have the stellar armor though. Actually, I guess we could swap to the infinity armor as well though. There we go. Now that's a much better fit for having the creative chest. Look at Espish as the infinity armor as well. He's got the drip and the sword of the cosmos. I better watch out. So, I hope you guys enjoyed me rambling for like 20 minutes or however long it's been. I hope you enjoyed. And uh, goodbye.